afternoon. It's an honor to be here today. Thank you very much, World Affairs Councils of Charlotte, not only for your kind invitation, but gracious hospitality, and for raising awareness of the struggle for freedom in Iran. This day is very important because we are approaching the one-year anniversary of the death in custody of the 22-year-old British Iranian woman, Masa Jina Amini, and the Women Life Freedom Movement in Iran. I am immensely grateful to everyone here today um, for not only showing solidarity, but for also amplifying the courageous voices of people in Iran. It was January 2012. The parents of Bolshevik Farahani, one of Iran's most celebrated actresses, took a call in their apartment in the capital city of Tehran. It was from a man who claimed to be an official of the Supreme Court of the Islamic Republic. The official was belligerent, believing Ms. Farahani's father that his daughter will be punished and that her breasts will be cut off and presented to him on a plate. A few days earlier, Ms. Farahani had appeared in a short black and white video with 30 other actresses of the French cinema to promote the César, the French Oscars, where she had been nominated for her role in the French comedy, Si tu meurs, je te tue. If you die, I will kill you. The artistic promotion and each of the actors taking off an item of their clothing as they stared directly into the camera in order to commit their quote unquote body and soul to their art. Miss Farahani chose to bear her breast. What followed in Iran in the aftermath was a cultural earthquake of sorts, an unimaginable taboo of epic proportions for an archaic misogynistic regime that legally prohibits bodily autonomy and is enshrined systemic gender discrimination and the inferior status of women in their constitution and the Islamic civil code. Ms. Farahani was only 29 years old and one of countless courageous and accomplished women in Iran who had excelled in their field despite the circumstances. A woman of immense talent who had received accolades worldwide, was now officially banished from our homeland. Why? Simply because she refused to conform to their restrictive rules, as well as their antiquated definition of womanhood. Four years prior, the government had also taken away Ms. Farahani's passport, and she was banned from working by the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance. Why? for not wearing the mandatory headscarf at the New York premiere of Ridley Scott's thriller, Body of Lies, where <coughs> playing opposite Leonardo DiCaprio, she became the first Iranian actress ever to appear in a Hollywood film since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. With all doors closing around her, she fled to France, and in 2009, when she spoke out against the Green Revolution, she was told not to return. Of life in exile, Ms. Farahani has said, Exile is like death. You cannot under understand it unless it happens to you. That being said, she is immensely grateful to France. For the first time, she said, I have appreciated being a woman. Paris is a city that liberates you from all the sins that you are told you are guilty of. It washes away all of that, and you are free. Today, Ms. Farahani is one of countless Iranians living in exile who are raising their voice to advocate for their fellow compatriots. 89 million people who yearn for basic rights and human dignity. 89 million people who yearn for freedom. 89 million people held captive by a regime that massacres its own people in order to maintain power by suppressing and silencing dissent. The horrific death of 22-year-old Masa Amini and the outpouring of grief and outrage across Iran and the global community has served as a magnifying lens into the regime's egregious human rights violations and never-ending list of crimes against humanity. 
What began initially as a greater call for civil liberties by women has evolved in the past year into an existential challenge and a fundamental threat to the legitimacy and the survival of the Islamic Republic. You may have seen powerful images and courageous acts of civil disobedience, women and girls taking to the streets and cutting off their hair, taking off their headscarves and burning them in protest and in rebellion. You may have seen images of Iranians from all walks of life chanting death to the dictator. You may have heard the iconic slogan, Woman Life Freedom, Three words that have captured the world's attention this past year. Three words that are emblematic of a fearless generation. Three words that reflect the right to live free from violence and discrimination. In the wake of Masa Amini's death, regime authorities have responded with brutal force, unleashing their security forces on peaceful protesters. To date, they have killed more than 550 people, innocent Iranians, 73 of them children. They have carried out executions after sham trials behind closed doors without due process of law. They have arrested and imprisoned more than 20,000 people from activists, journalists, artists, students, intellectuals, and ordinary citizens. Protesters have been subjected to unimaginable atrocities, reports of horrific sexual violence and sexual abuse of men, women, and minors in detention, torture, blinding with rubber pallets, and even the mass and deliberate poisoning of Iranian schoolgirls. And more recently, fearing renewed protests with the upcoming one year anniversary of the death in custody of Masa Amini and woman life freedom, the regime has embarked on a new wave of repression, targeting those who not only defy their barbaric, archaic laws, but also arresting family members of victims who seek justice for the murder of their loved ones. On September 16, 2023, we will remember and honor the legacy of Massa and all those who have paid the ultimate price for freedom. Like 16-year-old Nika Shakarami, peacefully participated in protests in 2022 and went missing for 10 days. Nika was kidnapped by Islamic Republic security forces, tortured and killed. Her body was delivered to her family. Her face was beaten beyond recognition. And 16-year-old Serena Ishmael bludgeoned to death as a result of baton blows to her head. She was buried on her 17th birthday. And 19-year-old Bekshaw Shahidi, a talented young chef with a bright future ahead of him, arrested during protests and beaten to death. He was buried on what would have been his 20th birthday. And 10-year-old Kian Firpala, whose body was riddled with bullets. Kian's father was also shot and is now paralyzed for life. And 19-year-old Abbas Mansouri, who died from severe torture several days after being released from prison. His crime, distributing chocolates with woman like freedom written on the wrapper. And 22-year-old Mohammed Benti Karami, charged with waging war against God. And sentenced to death after a tortured confession. His crime, peaceful protesting. A young man raised in poverty. His father was a street vendor who sold napkins and invested his life savings in order to make his son's dream a reality. You see, Mohammed grew up to become Iran's karate champion. Prior to being executed, he told his father, please tell, don't tell mom that I'm going to be executed. And just last week, 31-year-old Jabal Ruhi died from severe short torture in prison. His crime, dancing in the streets during the 2022 protests. And Masa Amini, whose tragic death sparked the largest display of unity by Iranians against the Islamic Republic in its 44-year history. Masa was born September 21, 1999, in the northwestern city of Sadness. 
On September 13, 2022, Massa and her brother went on a trip to Tehran. Massa was scheduled, scheduled to start university the following week, and this was to be her last holiday before she began her studies. She was arrested soon after arriving in Tehran for allegedly wearing her veil improperly. According to eyewitness reports, she was beaten not only in the morality police van, but also at the police station. Her brother said he saw bruises around her eyes and her legs. Massa died in a hospital room three days after being arrested. She was in a coma, resulting from fatal blows to her head. Images of her lifeless body laying in a hospital bed with tubes going in her mouth and her nose and bruises around her eyes starkly contradicted Iranian authorities' claims that she wasn't mistreated and had in fact died from underlying health conditions causing a sudden heart failure. Massa's family courageously spoke out against the morality police's actions. Her parents and brother said that she was in fact not improperly veiled and did not have any underlying health issues and also accused authorities of covering up their crime. Her father told reporters that when he asked to see the autopsy report, he was told by the attending physician, I will write whatever I want. It has nothing to do with you. Ms. Amini only saw, Mr. Amini only saw his daughter's lifeless body after it had been wrapped for burial. At Massa's funeral, her grandfather wrote the following on her grave. Massa, your name will be a symbol. Today, her name is indeed a symbol, a global symbol for, for, legacy, for freedom, and her legacy is eternal. One year later, women and girls in Iran continue to leave, and their message is loud and clear. We don't want an Islamic republic. And it is not accidental that they have taken the lead against the gender apartheid regime. From a historical perspective, it is important to remind that throughout the centuries, Iranian women have always fought with tenacity to determine their own fate. And while there were periods in history where they were relatively free to forge their own path, such moments have been few and far between. It is therefore important to apply a historic lens when it comes to understanding what is happening in Iran today, specifically how is it that women and girls are leading within the confines of a patriarchal society. It is important to go back in history and to look at women's rights and the women's movement in Iran. Simply because activism and securing women's rights are not causes born recently. The women of Iran have a rich and vibrant history, one which includes many inspirational female pioneers and trailblazers who have been fighting for expanded rights and opportunities. In the 6th century BC, Iran was a country which held beliefs and practices that would be deemed progressive by even 21st century standards. Zoroastrianism, the dominant religion at the time, reflected the equality of men and women to the extent that women occupied the same positions and professions as men and even received equal payment for their work. The authority and independence of women was an accepted part of the social system. Women ruled as queens over the vast Persian Empire. They served as high-ranking military commanders in the army and even owned and operated large businesses. With the Arab invasion of the 7th century, egalitarianism was significantly transformed. And with conversion to Islam, women's roles became severely restricted with an inferior status that was legally enshrined in the fabric of Iranian society. In the midst, middle of the 19th century, despite diminished rights and limited opportunities, women in Iran took it upon themselves to protest the tobacco concession granted to Great Britain. And in the early 20th century, they took part in the Constitutional Revolution of 1906, which sought to put a curb on the monarchy's extravagances as well as the sale of indulgences to foreign countries. During that same period, a nascent women's movement was emerging in Iran, 
when a handful of women began to courageously challenge the precepts of a patriarchal order, founding schools for girls, women's secret societies, and periodicals advocating for greater participation of women in society. In the aftermath of Islam, which for centuries had dictated the seclusion and slavery subservience of women, the Pahlavi monarchy witnessed the emancipation of the Iranian women with unprecedented rights and opportunities, including the enfranchisement of the female population at large. The 1979 Islamic Revolution ushered in a theocracy which dismantled the Pahlavi's progressive agenda, stipulating governance according to the precepts of Sharia law. Without a doubt, the enormous impact of this upheaval was reflected in the overnight erosion of women's rights, with their overall status shrouded in restrictions and patriarchal pronouncements ingrained in the Islamic constitution and civil code. Over the last 44 years, Iranian women have navigated the complexities and made remarkable strides despite the plethora of obstacles, challenges, and harsh realities of everyday life. And against the tide of gender discriminatory laws, policies, and norms, they have excelled in practically every field. They not only outnumber men in higher education, comprising two-thirds of all university graduates, they have initiated groundbreaking campaigns as well as a grassroots women's movement and are also distinguished for their myriad of outstanding accomplishments in practically every field. From award-winning scientists, authors, journalists, documentary filmmakers, Olympic athletes, and even the first woman to ever win the Fields Medal, also known as the Nobel Prize of Mathematics, the late Professor Nadia Musafani. And they have also always been part of national uprisings. However, this time, they are leading them. And they will change the course of history and are determined to do so, not just for themselves, but for all Iranians. In 1852, Iran's first suffrage martyr, Tahira, courageously defied conventional war by appearing unveiled in public. Her final words prior to being strangled and thrown down a guard well proved prophetic. You can kill me as soon as you like, but you cannot stop the emancipation of women. In the 21st century, Tahira's words and spirit echo in the extraordinary courage of countless women in Iran. Women like the human rights attorney Nasrin Sutuya who in 2019 challenged the mandatory bailing laws and was sentenced to 33 years and 148 lashes. Ms. Sutuya's sentencing set a new tone for the judicial oppression of women's rights. In a letter written to the prosecutor from prison, Ms. Sutuya wrote the following, tell your judges to issue triple digit sentences, but it won't make a difference because women in Iran have decided to rule over their own bodies. And in a letter written to, from prison to her children, she wrote, I want you to know that I am proud of the heavy sentence rendered against me, and honored to have defended my human rights defenders. I know you need water, food, shelter, and family, and parents. However, just as much, you need freedom, the rule of law, and justice. And Nargis Mohammadi, Iran's most prominent women's rights activist who is currently serving a 10-year sentence and has been repeatedly targeted by the regime, not only for her activism, but more recently for supporting the protesters in Iran. In a statement released from prison, she wrote, the covering of women's hair, contrary to claims by the religious government, was not for the preservation of women's dignity and control of men's sexual desires. In reality, covering our hair was for the preservation of this tyrannical power and satisfying the lust for power of despotic men. Now the world witnesses the power of resistance of women has shattered the tyrannical power of the religious government. 
There are few countries in the world in which women have experienced more sudden, shocking, and drastic overnight changes. As we approach the one-year anniversary of Masa Amini and Woman Life Freedom, it is more important than ever to continue to amplify, raise awareness, advocate, support, and show solidarity with Iranians. While the majority of Iranians feel that any transformation in Iran must be driven by the people, the global community, including international organizations, and those in leadership positions have a crucial role to play, simply beyond just extending messages of support. Why? Because there are no borders when it comes to human rights. Because systemic impunity should not be an option. Because engaging, negotiating, enabling, and empowering a regime that has no regard for human life is complicity. And because the regime is not only a threat to its own people, but also to the global community, given its status as the world's leading state sponsor of terror. While credible efforts were initially made to condemn and support, these efforts have more recently diminished. And in many ways, the international community, including those in leadership positions, have failed to effectively increase the cost of the regime's crimes against humanity. To cite a few examples, organizations like the United Nations, who have a responsibility to ensure the promotion and protection of human rights, should not be assigning leadership roles to Islamic Republic officials, as they have done so not only in the past, but unfortunately recently as well with the appointment of the Islamic Republic's ambassador as chair to the United Nations Human Rights Council Social Forum and the Islamic Republic envoy as one of the vice presidents of the upcoming United Nations General Assembly this coming month in New York. A regime who is not only killing children with impunity, but actually refers to the U.S. as the great Satan and one of their ideological pillars is death to America, are given visas to freely come and go in this country and to attend the United Nations General Assembly. And in late August, the visit of Ibrahim Raisi, President of the Islamic Republic, to South Africa, a country which has enshrined racial apartheid as a crime against humanity and made significant strides in the rule of law and justice accepts the representative of a tyrannical regime on its soil. Here, I believe, one protest banner sums it up best. Iranians do not need you to save them. They only need you to stop saving their murderers. So what can each and every one of us do to help support Iranians in their fight for freedom and not allow the regime's atrocities to go unnoticed? As an Iranian woman, and any, woman, any Iranian in this room today, I know I speak for all of us, that we would be eternally grateful if you would consider doing any of the following. Either attending a march, a vigil, or a memorial. There will be rallies and demonstrations and protests taking place all over the global community, from Washington, D.C., New York, Los Angeles, Milan, Rome, Paris, Helsinki, Geneva, and more, September 16th, to commemorate the one-year murder and custody of Masa Amin. Writing to your local representatives, such as members of Congress, asking if they would consider publicly supporting the people of Iran and their struggle for freedom. Signing an open letter urging countries to recognize crimes, gender apartheid, as a crime. Donating to various human rights organizations such as Amnesty International and the Center for Human Rights in Iran, which is a 501c3 New York based organization highlighting crimes against humanity in Iran. If you have an online presence showing solidarity by either posting and or sharing a message as to why you stand with the courageous people of Iran, don't discount the fact that you can make a difference, raising awareness is meaningful action in itself. Supporting the Massa Act, which was a bill introduced in the United States in the wake of Massa Amini's death, and is a critical pillar for holding the regime accountable.
Any effort would be greatly appreciated, especially given that we live in a society where we are fortunate enough not to suffer harsh repercussions for using our voice. We also need more countries to consistently condemn the regime's crimes against humanity and take decisive actions, such as implementing maximum pressure policies, including targeted sanctions, travel bans for regime agents, and their families of officials who are actually issued visas and either live or travel freely abroad. Exactly a century ago, American missionary Clara Colavo Rice wrote the following in her memoir, Persian Women and Their Ways. It is difficult to find many bright spots in the lives of Persian women. Their liberty of action, of movement, and of speech is curtailed. In the prevailing social condition, they could not do anything unless they were helped by men. But some of the women maintain, and I agree with them, that the day will come when the men will ask for their help. As the struggle for freedom in Iran continues, it is important to remind that women like freedom is not only a movement for the people of Iran. It is a movement for anyone who believes in freedom. It is a movement for anyone who believes in the power of ordinary people to bring about extraordinary change. 13th century Persian poet Rumi once said, Death breaks the cage, but doesn't kill the bird. The courageous people of Iran remind each and every day that even with clipped wings, those who passionately seek freedom never abandon the will to fly. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you so much for your words. Uh, inspiration. And uh, I think some new information for a lot of people in this room. My name is Laura Meyer Bellman, and I am delighted to serve as a member of the board of the Rural Affairs Council. And true enough, uh, 1979, the year that Dr. Ansari, as a young girl, left her country with her family to New York City, I was a newly minted banker with Citigroup covering Middle East Africa. I spent four years in Iran until I was forced to go away in the middle of the night was the bonding of my hotel. I met wonderful, wonderful Iranian women, and they stayed close in my heart, those that I had not stayed in touch with. As a result of that, I am going to choose a question to kick off with based on what I heard from you. Dr. Ansari received, you've heard, millions of awards. She's received medals and accolades. One goes back to 2016 from the publication Marie Claire, and it was for 14 women of privilege who had chosen to change the world. So I would like to know, as a woman, what was driving your use of resources, education, opportunity to take a path like this? So much for first of all sharing your experience with the Iranian Iranian women. It means a lot. Um, I was talking to somebody at my table, a young, a wee young girl, and she asked me a similar question. And I said, uh, when I left Iran, a lot of the narratives that came out in media and what you heard from family was only a fraction of the truth, meaning a lot of partial truth and um, misunderstood story. Of what had happened to women in Iran, a lot of stereotypical assumptions that were being perpetuated in public. Again, it was before the advent of social media. And when I began my scholarly journey at Columbia, I admit I was guilty myself of having this um, holding this portion of truth as whole truth. And what I came upon starkly contradicted my own misconceptions about women in Iran. And I was in awe of not only their courage, but what they were able to accomplish despite being in a patriarchal, only patriarchal but oppressive atmosphere. And I thought, you know, this is a story that needs to come out. This is a story that has not been told, at least not in mainstream. 
And I also felt that their courage and that the spirit, their resilience, their determination would also make them um, role models for women living in other oppressive societies, that you are able to break barriers, you are able to defy um, an authoritarian, theocratic regime. And when I started out my work, um, obviously women were subjected to horrific atrocities, but never to the extent we have seen this past year, as I mentioned, they're bludgeoning 16-year-old girls and getting away with it. This was not happening when I first started out. So the regime's um, crimes against humanity has been um, elevated to a whole other level. And my fear is that if we don't continue raising awareness, they will get away with it and we will continue this pattern. Excellent. Thank you. Now. I'm going to go first to one of our student tables, and I want you to be thinking about some good questions. We're not going to have a long time of questions, so get your hands up quickly, and I'd like to go to a student table if there's a student ready with a question. My name is Arsani Konchovny. I'm a student from Central Piedmont Community College. Nice to meet you. I got a question. What do you think is the biggest obstacle from uh, the evolutionary change of the political landscape? In Iran, because I see some parallels coming from uh, Ukraine, from like Russia, that people in general they do not support what's going on with the government. However, I notice some phenomenon of learned helplessness when they come to the protests, which gets suppressed. What do you think is the biggest obstacle from like changing significantly the political? It's nice to meet you as well. Thank you for your question. The biggest obstacle to people achieving freedom, gaining freedom from this regime, is the regime's own complex power structure. Um, it is not just the clerical establishment. We are dealing with the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Board, who, as far as we know, uh, number somewhere around 250,000. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard, or IRGC as they are known, uh, was in, they were initially established by the founder of the Islamic Republic, Ayatollah Khomeini, in the immediate aftermath of the revolution, as custodians of the regime. And over the last 44 years, they have consolidated their power in the economic sector and pretty much uh, have a hand in everything from oil and gas to transportation to air to the banking system. So they've evolved into one of the most powerful entities and more recently, about a dozen or so of them, of their officials, are also in President Raisi's government. So my fear is they're also extending their power into the government as well. So we're not just dealing with the supreme leader and security forces, we're dealing with an entire powerful conglomerate that has amassed a large fortune and amassed large power and that is what Iranians are up against. That's why there was a movement this last year to try to get countries to prescribe the IRGC as a terrorist organization, specifically because they are that. Who else? I see in the very back left there. Uh, yes, a white shirt. Hello, uh, I'm Shane. Uh, I'm a CECC student. I work at the Center for the Global North in Asia. To follow up with Darsan's question, and in response to what you said, you said that the IRGC has a huge control over the economic, I guess, like structure in uh, Iraq. And I'm just curious, like. Speak into uh, the microphone, we don't hear you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm a little nervous. But uh, I was just curious, since it has such a huge amount of control, how do you think they react? How do you think? The people would actually stand up to them, considering that uh, they pretty much control everything. Like you say, like people are able to stand up against them. People are st standing. Thank you for that question. People are standing up to them. Um, the average age of protesters in Iran is 15. Um, they long for freedom. They long for normality. There's a, they're vastly pro-Western, um, anti-government, and they are standing up against them, but again, they're up against an uphill battle. We 
those of us on the outside believe this is the first time that they will not stop because Iran has been sustained by protests over the last 44 years. What the regime's MO is, they massacred them. Um, last time in 2019, they killed about 1,500 people who were 1,500 protesters against the primarily high uh, inflation and cost of living. The regime has no problem massacring everyone in order to maintain um, control and to not give up the throne, so to speak. But one thing is for sure, you have a restive population who are resilient and determined, and they're putting up a good fight. And what the outcome will be, I don't know, but we all hope. We all hope for the best. And I know we have one in the far back, right side, to my right. Jump in there. Wait for the mic, please. My name is Greg Barber. I'm a student at Hickory Ridge High School. I'm currently a sophomore. And I just wanted to say, you're talking about that in 1979 and how that had a big change. I just want to know, like, what was the really big change that sparked who were they and what did they do? Well, was sorry, I didn't hear that. What was the what? Oh, you said currently it's 1979. You said there was like a really big yes. uh, spark of revolution, correct? Well, who were the people that really uh, made that happen and what did they do to uh, make that kind of change that we have currently? Well, that's, that's a great question. Uh, a lot of people came out in droves um, in supporting uh, Khomeini and he, Khomeini was exiled in the 60s by the Shah primarily because he was against a lot of the liberating measures instituted against the Shah, including the enfranchisement of women. He was initially exiled to Iraq, and when he was consolidating um, support from there, it was a little bit too close for comfort because it's a neighboring country, and he was sent before the actual revolution to Paris, where he was giving hundreds of interviews a week. There were journalists lining up to speak to him. As far as, you know, women supporting him, women did, believe it or not, initially support a misogynistic cleric. I believe one of the reasons, and I'm gonna quote people who are, who were there during the time who witnessed, I was only 12. One of them is Nobel laureate Shirin Abadi, the first Iranian Muslim woman to receive a Nobel Peace Prize. One of the first women who became a judge under the Shah, specifically because of the opportunities afforded to women. She actually wrote a memoir shortly after the revolution saying that she did support Khomeini's return. Um, and immediately um, when Khomeini took power, she was stripped of her judgeship because women are not allowed to serve as president or even as judges. Um, in, in this regime. She, in her memoir, talked about how, at the time, a lot of people felt the Shah's rapid westernization was unfamiliar, was an alien custom, it was not something they could wrap their head around, and a lot of people, according to her, at the time, felt he was more representative of uh, Iran's cultural authenticity, so to speak. But she writes that it took scarcely for me to realize when she was stripped of her judgeship, it took scarcely a month for me to realize that as a woman I had enthusiastically and willingly participated in my own demise. So uh, a lot of, again, misconceptions about a misogynistic cleric. Also, to be fair to Mrs. Abadi, I read a lot of the interviews Khomeini had given from Paris while in exile, interviews given to the British Guardian, interviews given to renowned um, female Italian journalists, Oriana Falacci, interviews given to Der Spiegel magazine, and in all fairness to Mr. Abadi, Khomeini pretty much, for lack of a better word, lied in his interviews. He said in an Islamic Republic, women will have complete freedom in their future, in their choice of attire, and their actions. So basically, he was, uh, was a disingenuous platform designed to amass support. Um, if you read history books, you'll see that it didn't take long for the revolutionary euphoria to subside. A lot of people, intellectual students, women who had supported Khomeini, became profoundly disillusioned in the immediate aftermath of the Islamic Republic. So it was, in terms of what the Shah did, he didn't do anything wrong. It was mostly a case of too much, too soon, um, and I, ironically, 
what the Shahnist uh, father had envisioned specifically for women in Iran has come to fruition among a generation with no living memory of him. <laughs> Questions? Uh, yes, please. Hi, my name is Trey Yana, and I'm a student at Providence Day. And my question for you is, if you could say one thing to the women of Iran, what would you say? Keep fighting. I think it's great that the age group asking questions is closest to that 15-year-old mark uh, that Dr. Ansari referred to. Um, but I would love to open it to older adults in the room <laughs> to the extent that uh, we have some questions. I, I, okay, um, as the facilitator, I have the right to call on my sister, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to represent the older people in the room. <laughs> um, my question is very different from the political questions we've been listening to. For me, when I hear you speak, the commitment and the emotion is so, so there, and it, it's really very stirring. And I wonder, how do you how do you get past the point of caring a lot and, and doing the background uh, protesting and pushing to becoming a person who stands before us and speaks her mind so freely, when it can't be easy to do so? Thank you for this question. I know I speak for so many of us who advocate for people in Iran lovely ladies back there sitting here as well do the same. We all struggle with emotional ups and downs, but at the end of the day, what keeps us going is what we're going through doesn't even hold a candle to what people in Iran are going through. And that's what fuels our activism, and that's what keeps us going, because especially the past year, because of social media and all the videos and reels that are coming, out from Iran, you're actually not just seeing a photograph or hearing a piece of poetry news, you're actually witnessing atrocities being committed. Uh, footage that you have heard about, but seeing it is a completely different story. And I think that's what keeps us going because we actually are seeing this, what's happening on the ground floor there. So it's something that I know none of us can stop doing and we won't stop doing until hopefully this regime is gone, but it's a collective collaboration, it's collective action, no one person, no one million per people, it's just, it takes everybody, it takes ordinary citizens, it takes activists, it takes politicians, it takes a whole village. Thank you for asking. And we have a question. Yes. Go up there. Thank you. I just have a question related to the faith aspect of this. As a Muslim woman, you know, I take some of this very personally and very seriously. And I just wonder how do you, how do women in Iran, from Iran, reconcile the Islamic part of it with the need and you know the, the rightful need to fight for their their rights? a great question. You know, the regime predominantly undertakes their atrocities under the guise of religion. That is one way for them just to, in their own minds, exonerate themselves of any wrongdoing. As I said, people who were executed for peacefully protesting were charged with waging war against God, right? What does that even mean? Right. So this is how they even justify the inferior position of women under, you know, they uh, attributed to verses in the Quran. <coughs> in the late 1990s to early 2000s, when the reformists had basically taken the reins, courageous religious women rights activists who don't subscribe to such um, interpretations, archaic interpretations, actually took on a bold move and began to reinterpret those very passages that were used to denigrate them. One, in order to show that Islam is able to evolve and adapt to the changing needs of 21st century society. Um, they also uh, were able to partially amend some of the gender discriminatory laws by arguing that these verses are not in fact interpreted the way they should be. 
It's a very bold move, especially when you're dealing with um, a religious you know, theocracy. But more than that, um, there are women activists, numerous activists in Iran who choose to wear the veil, for example. Uh, my own my own paternal grandmother always wore the veil. There is nobody has any problem, for example, with the veil. It is only the most as the most visible form of oppression. It's taken center stage. And women have suffered horrific atrocities for not wearing it or adhering to the mandatory veiling laws. But unfortunately, that again has come to take on a its stereotypical assumption of its own. I always say, if you choose to wear the veil, it's great, right? That no piece of garment should be legally enforced or not enforced. This goes back to Mrs. Sutuda's letter that women in Iran have decided to rule over their own bodies. We also deal with some of these issues here in the US. Um, the question of bodily autonomy, um, about what you can do, tell a woman to do or not to do with her body. Those are all things that have ripple effects no matter where you live, except in countries like Iran and now Afghanistan, as we see, they've taken on a whole other level of meaning. And again, unfortunately, religion is used as a way to undertake these atrocities for whatever reason, that is incorrect to use religion, but they use it as a tool for oppression. Many parallels uh, to be talking about. Next question, please. I was wondering what you think the impact if Iran is successful in the country, such as Afghanistan and Libya, who also have restrictions on them. I'm oh, sorry. Um, will it, if Iran is successful, will it have impacts on other countries such as Afghanistan and Syria? Um, I think, well, um, the problem with Afghanistan, Afghanistan is very different because um, unlike the Islamic Republic, for example, that allow women to get an education, women in Afghanistan, girls beyond secondary school have been banned from getting an education program. Working, they basically, as they say, they've been erased from society. They're not even allowed to come out unless they're chaperoned by a male guardian. I think the Taliban case is beyond tragic. I don't know if the women there will be able to overcome the Taliban. And just to put things in perspective, women have been fighting the Islamic Republic for over four decades. Um, and that's still an uphill battle, but I do think it will inspire them for sure, for sure. And I think they already are inspired, for example, um, the um, petition I asked if anybody would be willing to sign, which would be um, used to actually uh, implement gender apartheid as a crime in international law. This was a movement started by both Afghan and Iranian women. So yes, these things have the potential to have ripple effects and empower neighboring countries. And that conclude that does conclude our Q and A because we ran a little uh, a little longer. Um, can we do another round of merci? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm here just for two things. I'm Raj Bharadwaj. I also have the pleasure and privilege of serving on the board of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. So, first thing is uh, really on, on behalf of our uh, community in Charlotte and uh, the World Affairs Council. It's just been uh, amazingly moving, impactful, uh, eye opening, and insightful to hear from uh, Dr. Ansari. So, please join me in expressing my gratitude. Quick thing is, uh, I hope this has further provoked your interest in, in um, promoting global understanding and international education for folks who are not members. We invite you to join and be a member, and there is a desk on your way out. Thank you for your support, your engagement, your attendance today, and look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thanks again. Thank you.